Thank you, Keith. My name is Barney Morris, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Barney. Jesus, is it Sunday yet? When I die, and the guy tells me I only have 24 hours to live, I want to live it with Keith Gartner, because he can, the only one I know can make it seem like a week. <laughs> I love Keith, and he loves Alcoholics Anonymous, and his enthusiasm, his enthusiasm kept me uh, in AA for quite some period of time uh, when I did not want to be here, and, uh, and I uh, will forever be grateful to him and to his wife, uh, because um, they, were, they were enthusiastic about Alcoholics Anonymous, and they loved Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I did not understand that kind of an attitude, because I sure as hell didn't have any enthusiasm for what was going on around here. But, but they did, and their enthusiasm was infectious, and it kind of kept me going. And I will forever, of course, be grateful to Keith for finally getting me to buy Carol a cup of coffee, uh, because uh, she has uh, raised my six children and her two children. And uh, whatever is good about those kids, I think, is, uh, is Carol's responsibility, because she has really worked hard with those kids. And it's nice now, as she said this afternoon, that we don't have any more kids to raise. It's a great life. Uh, the last one is gone, thank God. <laughs> and now she and I could just kind of hang out together, and that's, that's what we're doing here. We're hanging out together, and we have remained sober together. And Carol, of course, is another major reason in my life why, uh, why I haven't uh, gone back out there and gone back to drinking, because many times I think in sobriety that would have happened. I've had an extraordinarily painful sobriety, uh, I have had a difficult sobriety uh, because I'm a very stubborn, self-willed, egotistical son of a bitch. <laughs> and I never do anything because it's a good idea. I do things because somebody forces me to it, and, uh, and as I will tell you in a moment, I finally have learned what surrender and the third step are all about because I was forced to that position as well by a God that I have come to understand in Alcoholics Anonymous, because for a long time I did, not only didn't understand God, I didn't believe there was a God, and I thought that was all hogwash. But I had to be beaten down totally in sobriety in order to finally surrender. I believe today that my principal problem in sobriety is ego. And I believe that my principal solution, one day at a time, is surrender. If he says it twice, it's probably important. I believe today that my principal problem in sobriety is ego. And I believe that my principal solution one day at a time is surrender. And um, if you are new and you don't understand what I just said, it's perfectly all right. Because I believe that I could not have, have come to surrender intellectually. I don't think I could have thought my way to surrender. I could not have read the big book long enough to learn how to surrender. I could not have gone to enough AA meetings to know how to surrender. I could not have worked with enough newcomers to learn how to surrender. If you are new, I must tell you, if you stick around AA long enough, life finally will surrender you. So don't worry about it. <laughs> As they said to me when I was new, put your ass in the chair, leave your head outside, and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and it works a hell of a lot better if you don't drink between meetings. <laughs> I often uh, tell people that I am an egotistical, arrogant, no good son of a bitch, and that is absolutely true. But the, but the flat fact is, in addition to that, for many, many years in my life without even knowing it, I was frightened and I could not identify that feeling as fear. I felt inadequate and I never called that by its right name. And I had a great sense of impending doom, if you will, and we hear about that in AA all the time. That means things have always been screwed up in my life and I see no reason to believe that it ain't going to be screwed up tomorrow. Now, the reason all that was going on, in my opinion, was the people around me. I was surrounded by people all my life who never understood me very well. I'm an extraordinarily sensitive human being. I want you to know that because in case we encounter one another one-on-one, -on -one, it's important for you to understand that I'm a hell of a lot more sensitive than you are. I feel things more deeply. 
I am more easily hurt. So no matter what I say to you, no matter how badly I screw you, please be nice to me. <laughs> because I know you can handle it, but I can't. I don't deal well with rejection. And, uh, and my sensitivity and my feeling of being different in that sense uh, damn near killed me. It damn near killed me sober and damn near killed me drunk. And, uh, and it took me a long time to, to find out a little bit about Barney, to even be willing to look at Barney and to take a look at the fact that, that it wasn't all of them out there who were doing it to me. It was Barney doing it to Barney. I perceived much of my life that I had a lot of pressure on me. I had, a, I had a, a, a lot of people that were just putting a heavy load on my shoulders that I couldn't carry, that was more than I could stand, and I was doing the best I could to carry it, and they never seemed to get that, because they just kept putting more bricks on the load. And what I never understood, and finally after some period of time in Alcoholics Anonymous, I came to understand, the pressure that I felt in my life was never put on me by anybody else or anything else. There were no outside forces putting pressure on me. The pressure I was feeling, the pressure that was driving me crazy all my life, was coming from right in here. Because as you heard people say here today, earlier speakers made the point that we are responsible for our own behavior. And Sally, I think, made, made, made the point about no matter what anybody does to me, what's wrong with me? Yeah, I'm the end of with me and give me a bad time, I can react to that or I can choose not to. If my wife decides to put a lot of pressure on me one day because she's having a bad day or the kids have been driving her crazy, I have a choice. I can react to that or not. And it is the single thing that I spend more time talking to newcomers at AA about and that is, God damn it, stop reacting. <laughs> you are doing it to you. I was talking to a very wealthy lawyer the other night. And he has tremendous money, tremendous law practice, He's got a beautiful family, lives in Beverly Hills, got everything he ever wanted. The guy's had heart surgery twice. And he's talking to me in the car, and he says, if they, if they don't stop doing it to me, I'm going to have another heart attack. And I, that's me. That's the way I was all my life. They were doing it to me, and I always knew that. And it turns out not to be true. I want to thank Kim uh, for inviting me up here to, to come and talk. I'm always kind of surprised when people want to <coughs> have me fly some period of, of, of distance and, uh, and talk to a group of people, most of whom I don't even know about something I don't even do anymore. I, it, it really surprises me that... But that's Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't know. And then a whole bunch of other people will come in and drive hundreds of miles. Some of the people here have driven hundreds of miles to come in here and sit and listen to this nonsense. I mean, it just amazes the living hell out of me, and they all think it's terrific. I don't know. And I know they didn't come for that moose. I would have bought it and given it to one of my babies, but I ain't got what it's worth 58 bucks. <laughs> I get the sickest people. I know that they're sending them over to me. But anyway, it is nice to be here, and it's been fun. I mean, I said to Kimmy earlier, which I know she thinks I'm just being nice when I say this, but I mean it sincerely. Uh, I'm not a circuit speaker. I don't run around all over the country and do all this kind of stuff. Keith does a lot of that, and Sally does it. Lots of folks in AA are on the circuit. I ain't on the circuit. I'm just kind of a dummy that, that don't drink anymore, and every once in a while I go talk. And, uh, uh, but I'm not, I'm not out there beating the bushes a lot with this, and, and, and uh, it's all right with me. Because <laughs> I'm not real thrilled about doing this. I do this because I believe this will keep me sober, see, and that's why I'm here. If you're new tonight, you've got to understand, I am not an authority on the subject of alcoholism. We've got lots of those. Just check out any of the hospitals. They'll all talk to you. I'm not an authority on the subject of alcoholism, and I am not an authority on the subject of Alcoholics Anonymous, God knows. I'm just a drunk, and as, as uh, 
a speaker that I love so much at one time used to say, I'm just an example, good or bad, that AA works because it has been working in my life for a little over 17 years. And, uh, and I'm here primarily for the same reason that I make coffee at my home group in La Jolla. I'm here primarily for the same reason I'm a cake lady at my home group in Los Angeles, because I got one up there. I go to the Wednesday night meeting in LA, and I go to the Saturday night meeting in La Jolla, and I'm the cake lady on Wednesday night. And just this past Wednesday night, I was able to put 22 candles on a cake for this guy. And that was fun. Because when I met him, he only had four and a half years, you know, and I thought that was forever. And uh, that impressed me. Guys stay sober four and a half years. I mean, I knew my case wasn't that bad, but I thought it was nice for him. I figured 60 or 90 days would be fine for me. But I, um, I'm very thankful to, to Kimmy for asking me to come up here, and I thank her husband, Tom, for being so nice to us, to Carol and me, and, and Tom drove me around a little bit yesterday and showed me the the ghost town up here in the assay office and all that kind of stuff and it's just exciting and it's a beautiful place and I have loved being here more than any place that I have ever been of this kind uh, it's just been a really fun conference with people that I know uh, are my kind of people I have felt it in this room I have felt it outside I have felt it everywhere I've gone here this weekend that you're my kind of people and I love you and I'm, most of you I don't even know But I gotta tell you that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought it was impossible for me to ever say anything like that. I didn't love anybody. And I knew that I never would. I never experienced love in the way that I heard other people talk about it. Now, as a child, I had been taught a lot about love. I had been taught about God's love. I had uh, a Roman Catholic education all my life. I had eight years of education with the Dominican nuns in Chicago, on the south side, if there's any Chicago people here. I grew up at 67th and Blackstone on the south side, and uh, my brother was a Blackstone Ranger when that was a white gang. I mean, that's how far back we go. <laughs> and uh, everybody thinks that started with the Black Keystone Nation and the Black Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. It didn't. There was a white gang in that neighborhood called the Blackstone Rangers uh, back in the late 30s and the 40s, and he was a member of that gang. And uh, uh, it was a poor neighborhood. We didn't have anything. We all lived in, in what we called flats, six flats on the south side of Chicago, and I didn't know anybody that actually lived in a house. Uh, they, I thought that was just in movies. And uh, we had nothing, but I had this great education, marvelous education. Those Dominican nuns, God, they did the best they could. I know they did. And I, and I had the Carmelite priests in high school, and they were wonderful men. And they tried very hard to give me a set of standards to live by, to give me some principles to live by, my life by that would make me happy. But I never reacted or responded to what they were trying to teach, I guess. And I had the Holy Cross Fathers at the University of Notre Dame. And all of these people tried all their lives to not only teach me how to read and write, but to teach me these moral principles of living. But see, I knew something when I was seven or eight years old that I never really wanted to let anybody know. And that is that I'm a moral leper. I am incapable of being good. If you divide the world, and I always did, between the good people and the bad people, I knew which side I was on, baby. And I knew it very early on. And I accepted that about me. And when I say a moral leper, that means that I not only sin a lot, I enjoy it. <laughs> and I knew as a child there was something wrong with that. You're just not supposed to get that much fun out of it. And I used to go to confession and confess my sins, and I knew that I was going to go out and do it all over again anyway, but I did it because the other people did it, and there we were. And I was doing the best I could to look all right, because I learned very early on that if you look okay, if you look like you're like the rest of them, they're going to promote you and get you to the next grade and give you good marks on your report card, and they're going to take care of you, and you can be successful. And I wanted desperately to be successful. It was the most important thing in my life just to be somebody, because down deep inside I knew I was nothing, absolutely nothing. And I, he, he described it one time when I was newly sober. He said, you know, alcoholics, they come in here feeling like peeled zeros. That's less than nothing. And see, I knew all my life that that's what I was. I knew that, but I don't want anybody else to know it, because if they find out, they ain't going to let you be successful. And I want to make money, baby. I want to get some stuff. 
because my definition of success without even really thinking about it all of my life was the accumulation of stuff. If I just get a lot of stuff, then they're going to know I'm okay. And I'm going to know I'm okay. And everybody's going to be okay. But I got to get more stuff. And the more stuff I got, the worse it got. Because after you get a lot of stuff, then there's somebody who's got more expensive stuff than you. And so you got to get the more expensive stuff. And it'll drive you nuts. Because there's always somebody with more stuff. But I set about, as a young man, the business of trying to accumulate stuff. Now, I never really wrote that down anywhere or thought about it. It just, it just dawned on me in AA. That's what I was doing. I was just getting stuff. Now, what do I need all this stuff to feel good for? What do I need all this applause to feel good for? Why do I need people to tell me I'm okay? Very simply, because I don't think so. Because down deep inside, I know I'm a peel zero. I know I'm a moral leper. I know I'm a rotten, no good son of a bitch. I know these things about myself. And it hurts, and it bothers me, and it makes me feel bad, but it's a fact. And I just walk around. Now, when you're walking around with feelings like that, and you feel totally more sensitive than everybody else, and you feel frightened that you don't even know enough to put a label on it. You don't know it's fear. I didn't know it was fear. I just felt uneasy. I felt uncomfortable about life. I thought something the hell's wrong. I don't know what the hell's wrong. I'm getting stuffed. And I had a wife by that time. I'd married this girl. I married when I was 21. She was 20. We started having kids. We had six kids. I had these kids. <laughs> and I had a house. I bought a house. And I, and I was putting stuff in the house. <laughs> had the TV and I had the stereos and I had a beautiful wooden bar that I absolutely adored. <laughs> and I liked it because it had a mirror in it. When I opened the doors, I could look at the guy I loved. <laughs> and it was just, it was, it, I was as sick as I could be and I didn't even know it. I just knew that life was difficult and life was pressure and life was anxiety filled and life was responsibility. And I like responsibility. I want to be irresponsible, baby. I want to just do what I want to do. I want to have some fun for Christ. Well, I was a very fortunate young man. I ended up in a, in a business that allowed me to make a lot of money and get a lot of stuff. I ended up in the broadcasting business. By accident, I fell into it. And I, I worked in radio broadcasting for a while. And, and then I went into television. And, and I was very young when I got into that. And by the time I was 26 years old, I was the anchor man for a television station owned by ABC in Detroit. And it was just wonderful. Because I was something. Finally, I was something. Finally, I was somebody. Finally, I just didn't have to walk around and be nothing. But the trouble is, if you're in Detroit, you look at New York and you want to be in New York. Because you know that they're more than you are. And you want to be in L.A. and you want to be in the big markets and you want to make the big money. And, uh, and Jesus, I was making a lot of money. They were just handing me money hand over fist. They were flying me and the other anchor man into New York and putting us up at the Leonard Goldenson Suite in the New York Hilton Hotel and buying us champagne and flowers filled the rooms and show tickets and, hey, baby, whatever you want, you got. Because we owned Detroit. And we were the only station in the ABC chain at that time that had number one ratings. And ratings are the name of the game. And we were number one. The Detroit Riot helped us a lot. <laughs> Burn, baby, burn. I mean, it was just wonderful. We had six days. It was just dynamite. They got there and burned the whole town down. And we had the best pictures. I mean, it's a sick business, but I'm a sick guy. I mean, when you're cheering for people to burn buildings down, come on. But that's the way it was. And I tell you, we just felt, I know that we felt... Here, I'm 27, 28 years old when this stuff is going on. I can't even believe it. Now, when I look back, but then it seemed like that's the way it was supposed to be. I'll tell you another thing. The other guy that was anchoring with me at that time was in a recovery hospital in Laguna Beach about a week ago. He's dying of this disease. And I tried to 12-step him half a dozen times. And he says... 
I say, God love you. And he's dying of the disease. I got a brother in Chicago dying of the disease. And after I 12 stepped the hell out of him on the phone one time, he wouldn't even speak to me for a year. And he's okay. They put him in a straitjacket about once a year, throw him in the hospital for a while, he shakes it out. He's all right. Nothing wrong with him. Perfectly normal behavior. <laughs> Social drinkers go into hospitals in straitjackets all the time. And by the way, I'll give you another test that a friend of mine uses. If you're sitting here and you're wondering if you're alcoholic, forget the 20 questions, forget all that stuff. I got a beautiful test for you. All you got to do is answer one question, yes. If the answer is yes, you're an alcoholic. Don't worry about it. The question is this. Other than the al in here, I would put this to the people who drink. Are you now, or have you ever been in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? If the answer to that question is yes, you're an alcoholic. Man. <laughs> Social drinkers never think of coming here. I mean, can you imagine a guy that, you know, has a couple of social drinks once in a while, and he wakes up one morning, and, and he's 600 miles away, and he says, Oh, God, I think I'll run up to Pony to that AA conference. <laughs> social drinkers just don't do that. Never occurs to to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. They just don't do it. So if you're here and you're a drinker, you're in the right place. You're all right. Stay with these people who love you because they do. They do. And, and even if you don't love yourself, they do. And it don't make any difference if you care. They still love you. So stay with them. But I didn't know that. See, I was just out there getting stuff and I was getting successful and I was making money and I was Mr. Wonderful. And I'm crazier than hell. I got six kids, I got responsibilities, I got a wife who's driving me crazy because my drinking, she thought, was a little peculiar. <laughs> now, I'll admit this to you. I'll admit it right now, no problem. I would have admitted it then. When I drink, I look very alcoholic. <laughs> so a lot of people made that mistake. <laughs> I had well-meaning people who would say to me, and you understand, I'm a television anchor, man. I'm Mr. Something here. And they would say to me, you know, Barney, and I'll give you one of Charlie's lines. People used to lay this on me all the time. You know, Barney, you're, Jesus, you know, you're really a nice guy. And then I knew what was coming. But you know, it, it just, it looks like you got a drinking problem. And I knew I didn't have a drinking problem. You know why I know I don't got a drinking problem? Because when I drink, I feel better. How can that be a problem? Other people have a problem when I drink, but I don't have a problem. Drinking makes me feel better, for God's sake. That's why I do it. If spinach would do that to me, I would buy a spinach farm. And I would lay down and OD on this stuff. Alcohol made me feel better. And so I didn't understand these people when they started talking about, looks like you drink too much. Jesus, if you had my responsibilities and my problems and those six kids and that bitch I married, you'd think I got to do. And how the hell am I supposed to know? I'm sitting in a bar, right? And there's eight or ten guys in the bar, and we're all drinking. What are they telling me I got a problem for? But, you know, I would have admitted to being a glutton. I'll buy that. I drink a lot, sure. But I can handle it. I took pride. I took absolute pride in my ability to outdrink everybody around me. I thought it was wonderful. I can drink more than everybody here. Oh, great. Good luck. We'll see you later. We're going home. But I don't care if those guys leave at 8 or 9 o'clock at night because there's going to be a whole new bunch coming at 10. And I can impress them. <laughs> and if they're not impressed, I'll buy them a drink. What the hell? I haven't got any money, but I sign tabs all over town. Sure. It's great. It was, it was unbelievable. But, and I, and, and the, the, the part of it that amazes me today, in a way, except that I know I lived it, but the part of it that, is, that kind of amazes me is that I never saw it. I never could see what was really wrong. 
Carol talked about it today. I never saw what was wrong. Now, here's the other side of that business about looking like a drunk. The other side of the business of looking like a drunk is when you don't drink. Now, in order to impress my wife with my sincerity, in order to impress people around me that I was going to be okay, that there was nothing wrong with me, from time to time during my life, I quit drinking. I went in the wagon. And I would go days. Well, Jesus. I mean, I'm talking days of going home every night. I'm talking days of taking the kids to Y Indian guys in Little League. I'm talking days of smiling at home and hi, how are you? It's nice to see you. I'm talking days of showing up for work in a row. That's a long time. But I did it. And I proved it because I would go a week, I'd go a week and a half, no booze. And I'd do the right thing, and I'd be a good husband, and I'd take the garbage out, and I'd cut the grass, and I'd straighten out, and I'd be okay. Just to prove it to him and to me, I'm fine. Christ Almighty, I haven't had a drink in a week. I'm all right. But the trouble with that is what's happening to me inside. Because the longer I stay sober, the more uncomfortable I become. And I feel anxiety, and I begin to feel this fear that I can't even identify, and it's just pouring over me. And I'm going crazy. And I'm going to work. And I'm going home. And I'm taking out the garbage. And I'm cutting the grass. And I'm being good. <laughs> One time, in order to prove to this wife that I was okay, I even went and taught Sunday school. <laughs> I went down and I talked to the pastor of this church and I said, I could teach Sunday school. I said, I had 16 hours of theology at Notre Dame. I could teach these kids. I know a lot about God. I didn't want to tell them I didn't believe in God because that upset them a little. So I just, but who cares? You teach the kids, you get a few points at home. What the hell? Taught Sunday school. Man, I did everything I could. But I'm going to tell you something. After about a week or a week and a half of that sobriety crap, I figure I got to get mine now. I've been good. I've been doing everything for them. I've been giving them theirs. They got it. The kids got it. She got it. The boss got it. Everybody got it. Now I'm going to get mine. Because if I don't have a couple drinks, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> but this time, swear to God, this time, I'm going to have two or three drinks. I'm going home. <laughs> That's it. I'm not going to lose my car anymore. But the, but the pressure and the anxiety and the frustration that I feel, i got to have some relaxation. i got to take it. I got to take the edges off, baby. i got a pressure job. I've got a responsible job. Jesus, look who I am. I vote for God's sake. I'm a responsible person. So I go out and I just have a couple, just a couple. I'm just going to have a couple. But if you only got to drink two, you better make them doubles. Right? You're going to go home. I'm going home. I'm going to have two and then I'm going home. But you know what happens? Somebody shows up in the bars, a guy I haven't seen in a long time. Maybe it's somebody you never even met before. <laughs> Well, you gotta buy her a drink. Could something could happen here? You, ne you never know. Get her a couple drinks. You never know. You know I can't tell you how many drinks I bought for women I never met before or after they left that bar. But I bought them drinks because I'm that kind of a guy. I'm a wonderful, warm person. I'm doing the best I can to look good, and uh, that's what I did. Now, there is this peculiarity about my drinking. See, here I am. When I drink, I feel better every damn time. If I stay sober too long, I get crazier than hell. That don't look like a drinking problem to me. Looks like a sobriety problem to me. <laughs> and I don't know where the hell you're going to go with that. Sobriety's anonymous. I don't know what you do with that. <laughs> And you know, after you haven't had a drink for a week and you're just crazy and you're ready to kill somebody and the pressure of the job and the pressure of being a father and the pressure of the bills is just getting to you, some son of a bitch always walks up and says, Oh, God, you look so good. <laughs> say, yeah, well, if you say that to me again, I think I'll rub your, rip your jugular vein out. How would you like that? Because I don't feel good. I feel terrible. 
Oh, the puffiness has gone out of your face and your eyes have cleared up. I don't give a shit. <laughs> You're obviously confusing me with somebody who cares what you think. So drinking makes me feel better, sobriety makes me feel terrible, and then there's this other awful, horrible, sad, oh, sad thing about my drinking. It really is, because drinking is so much fun and it makes me feel so good and it's just great. Here's the peculiarity about it, it's just weird. It's just really weird. See, once I begin to drink, I don't seem to be able to stop. Ain't that the damnedest thing? I just keep drinking. And drinking and drinking and drinking. That's the way I do. And I travel, I move around a lot, a lot when I drink. I go from bar to bar. Because you always know the action is going to be better down there. You ever do that? You're sitting in the bar, there's no action here. I don't know what I ever meant by that. There's no action here, I'm going up. Like the scotch is different in the other joint, right? The beer is going to taste different someplace else. Got to get some action. But a time, you know, by 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night, midnight, I was so drunk, action was an impossibility. <laughs> I don't care what kind of action you're talking about. But I'm going where the action is, baby. So I'd go from bar to bar, I'd go from city to city sometimes, country to country once in a while. And it's embarrassing, I woke up one time in the, in the airport in Miami, and that's not too bad, except it was Saturday afternoon, and the last thing I could remember was having a couple of drinks in a bar on Friday night in Detroit. And, and, uh, and that's not too bad, except it's always, all airports tend to look a little alike. You're never sure which city you're in. And you don't want to ask anybody. Because <laughs> you're still trying to look good, you know. You're hung over and you feel bad, but you've got to look good. If it ever happens to you, if you decide to go out there and hit it again and it happens to you, the trick is go find the newspaper rack. I finally figured that out. Except in Miami, they have a lot of Chicago Tribunes, New York Times, Washington Post. <laughs> but they had a lot of Miami Herald, so I don't know, it must be Miami. And then you go home and you're trying to do the right thing. You're going home, right? And you get there finally and you just, you feel bad. I mean, you feel bad. Terrible, hungover, tired, you've had a long trip, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and you walk in, what the hell's the inevitable question? Where have you been? You don't want to know, leave me alone. I can't remember. They don't believe that shit, you know, I don't remember, they don't believe that. Social drinkers, for Christ's sake. Never had a decent blackout in their lives, huh? <laughs> Well, I knew, I knew that it was, it was just awful. Life was awful, and I didn't know what the hell to do about it. I'm trying to be successful. I'm trying to be something. Finally got a job in Los Angeles. Went out there. I thought, now I can now be all right. I'm going to go to L.A. where the money is and where the big time is, where everything's good. And I went out to Los Angeles, and, and it turns out the scotch tasted the same there that it did in Detroit. And things got worse. And I started making all kinds of rules about my drinking. I would only drink on Tuesdays and Thursdays, except if there was a lot of pressure on Friday or Monday or but I had these rules about drinking never drink in the morning and I never did I never drank in the morning unless I was drunk when I got home and uh, and I was drinking in the morning I never got arrested for drunk driving I drove drunk all the time never got arrested for it I never was hospitalized because of alcoholism I was never fired from a job because of alcoholism now you understand my bosses at ABC know for a long time now that I'm a drunk they know it for a long time but I'm never fired, so that's another reason I'm not an alcoholic. Not, not an alcoholic. Not that. I may be a lot of things, baby, but I ain't that. Well, when I was 35, this woman that I'd been married to for 14 years divorced me. I couldn't understand that. It didn't make any sense to me. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I hadn't been inside a church in 15 years. But that was one of my reasons. And I couldn't see how she was going to get along. What the hell was she going to do without me? I'm Mr. Wonderful. I've been making the money all my life. I gave her all this stuff. <laughs> gave her those six kids. What the hell else she want? <laughs> but it, she was determined. She said, no, that's it. I've had it. 
And uh, and she was walking out, and I finally I looked at her, and I said, well, if you got to go, you got to go, I guess. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to demand custody of the six children. She said, okay. <laughs> And it turned out, much to my surprise, that I owed a lot of money. I didn't know that. Because she handed me this big basket of bills, and I, uh, I owed thousands of dollars. I didn't have any way to pay it, so a lot of it was debt money. That's when you owe for things that don't even exist anymore. And that's not fair. <laughs> but I took my six kids. The house was sold. The order by the court was that the house be sold, and the two lawyers split what was left. I had a resentment against lawyers for a long time. But now I get my revenge. I sponsor a couple of them. <laughs> what do you mean you your steps? <laughs> but I took my six kids and I went to this apartment in Santa Monica. And I hired this housekeeper and, and she didn't speak English and I didn't speak Spanish. So I couldn't talk to her and, and <clears throat> I couldn't pay her. And I couldn't even tell her that I couldn't pay her. <laughs> but she was, she was really a good girl. If she, she took care of those kids. She seemed to care about them a lot. And I, uh, I, uh, I tell you what I did, though, right after we moved to that apartment. I, uh, maybe even before I got to the apartment. I can't quite remember. Those were kind of foggy months. But I, I got drunk. I mean, that's what I do. I, my, when the pressure is on and I'm feeling anxiety and frustration and life is, I'm just getting screwed again. I'm just getting screwed again. And I went out and got drunk, and, and that's the night that Keith talks about, because he had met me some months before and given me his card. He told me right out, I mean, he said, I'm an alcoholic, like he was proud of it. And I thought that was a little weird. And told me he hadn't had a drink in over four years. Jesus. And as I said, I knew my case wasn't that bad, but... Anyway, I didn't know what else to do. It was the middle of the night. Nobody talked to me. My brother hung up on me. Everybody hung up on me that night. And I had his card in my wallet. And I thought, well, they like to talk to drunks. What the hell? <laughs> so I called him up. We talked for a long time. I don't remember what we said. And he gave me his, his work phone number. And I wrote it. I remember I scrawled it in yellow Crayola on a piece of scratch paper. And I had it stuck it in my wallet. And I, and I went home and passed out and, and uh, went to work the next day. And I was sitting at work, and I opened my wallet for something, and that little piece of scratch paper fell out. And I picked it up, and it was this orange Crayola. And suddenly it dawned on me what I'd done. I'd called one of them. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And I called him up, and I said, I'm really sorry that I called you in the middle of the night last night. I didn't mean to do that. I was very drunk. He said, yes, I know. But I said, I'm not really alcoholic, not in the way that you people apparently are alcoholic. I said, me, I, I just thought maybe I could, you know, sober up for a while. I don't seem to be able to stay, so, stay sober longer than about a week. And I'd like to make it for like about 60 days. And then what I could do, I could get some money. I could get my, my work going and I could accumulate some money. And I'd get my life straightened out, get my head straightened out. Because right now it's a little screwed up. And I just need to get my life organized again. And I figure 60, 90 days, I'll be fine. But I can't stay sober that long alone. And, uh, and he and Mark picked me up, and we went to dinner, and I bought dinner. And the real reason I bought dinner that night, I don't really know if they were broke or not, but I was so arrogant. And I thought, these two poor alcoholics, I just have to do something nice for them. <laughs> now, you understand, I'm so broke, I can't see straight. I owe thousands of dollars. I'm living in this goddamn apartment, can't even pay my housekeeper, and I'm offering him money. I'm going to buy your dinner, guys. Don't worry about a thing. Sign for it, shit. Why not? <laughs> And then we went to this meeting. Now, I don't like AA meetings even before I go. And we went in, and I was right. I didn't like it. And he, he bought me one of those blue books. And, uh, and his enthusiasm is just more than anybody can bear most of the time. He's just, he loves Alcoholics Anonymous. And he's introducing me to all these people I don't want to meet, and we're... And I'm listening to all these terrible stories, these guys. It was a men's stag in Beverly Hills. There's about 60 guys there. And they're all getting up telling these stories. And it was just horror stories. Terrible things happened to these guys. I felt sorry for them. 
And uh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, people say you got to identify. I don't identify with that crap. I mean, there's guys that were in jail, guys that were, you know, they left families all over the country and they were, and they lost all this money and they didn't have any jobs. And I don't identify with that stuff. I'm still working. I'm still working. And I vote. And I'm a big shot. And, I, and after that, they go to coffee shops, endless coffee shops. And then I went to another meeting the next night. He had a guy pick me up and take me to that Brentwood meeting. And, and it was surprised me that they do this crap every night. <laughs> but the meetings were just boring, just terribly boring. I mean, it was the same crap every meeting. They get up and some guy leads it. It always looks like he's cheerful. I'm Charlie, I'm the alcoholic. Ah. And then they get somebody to get up and read, and they always read the same stuff out of the book. Like they can't remember it. It's... I mean, I could read the book if I wanted to, but mind you, I'm not reading the book, but I could read the book. I don't want to read the book because I ain't going to be around too long anyway. But I don't need to have somebody read chapter five and how it works. Night after night after night after night. And now here are our traditions. You know, I don't know what the hell that was. I figured it was to quiet the crowd down after the coffee break. I don't know. And then he gets up, some guy gets up and tells his story. Ah, oh, there, there's old George. Yeah, there he is. Good. And he tell about the jails and the hospitals and the institutions and the drunkenness and Skid Row and on and on it went and I just thought I was going to throw up. And I'm telling him, I'm being honest with him. He's the only one I was talking to, really. And I said, you know, uh, I, I ain't getting this. I'm not too happy here. I don't know what these people are talking about, and I don't think I want to know. Because you got some sick cookies in here. And he said, well, you got to get into action. If he said it once to me, he said it a thousand times. I was just ready to just scream. you got to get into action. And I'd say, well, like what? He said, well, go see the secretary and give you a job. So I became a floor mopper on Tuesday night. And then I became a coffee maker on Saturday night. And then I, I became a greeter at the Echo Park meeting on Thursday night. I'd stand at the door and shake hands with every one of them. Hi, my name is Barney Howard, and I'm raising my hand. I'm saying I'm an alcoholic, and I don't believe it for a minute. But I don't want to put these people off because I'm going to their damn meetings. And you tell them you don't think you're an alcoholic, they work on you harder. <laughs> oh, they do, they won't leave you alone. There's one more couch, baby. I was going to heave it right over the goddamn railing. <laughs> I haven't moved my own furniture in 15 years. Oh, Christ. And then they got all these stupid rules. Always thank hands, shake hands with the speaker. Why? What if I don't like them? Well, you do it anyway, because that's going to help you keep sober. You go up, you don't have to say he gave a good talk if you don't. Now, he's an athlete. I understand why he wants to. He's looking good out there. He's playing volleyball, softball. He was an athlete always like professional football player, for Christ's sake. I'm no good at that. That isn't what I do. I can't hit the ball. Strike out. Every goddamn Saturday I struck out. It seemed like either him or his sponsor was pitching all the time. They thought it was funny. Look at the newcomers. Strike it out. Look bad, you look bad. I'm trying to look good. I'm going to meetings, I'm going to meetings, I'm going to meetings. One time we went up, we went to Monterey for a goddamn meeting one time. That's nine hours away. He thought it was wonderful. It makes no sense to me, I don't understand. But I turned around one day and I made a discovery that really surprised me. And Chuck C. was talking one night. But he did say one thing, and I heard him say it that night. He said, when I was about six months sober, I made a discovery. He said, I discovered that I hadn't had a drink in six months. Now, I thought that was a little goofy, too. <laughs> Except that I was just about six months sober. And I sat there and I thought... Jesus, I haven't had a drink in six months. Think about that. And it suddenly dawned on me, my God. I've been going to these stupid meetings. I hate these goddamn people.
But I haven't had a drink in six months. That impressed me. I thought, and then I got thinking. I'd go to these meetings, and I hated the meetings, and I'd sit there, and I'd think, and I saw them up here getting them birthday cakes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. It looked so childish and so sophomoric to me. And then I thought, what if I get one of them cakes? Because I wanted to make a speech. And nobody was asking me to make a speech. And I had a speech for him, all right. My speech was going to be, hey, I'm going to tell you something. I hate your goddamn meetings. I think your program stinks. There ain't a thing in that book I like. I hadn't read it, by the way. I glanced through it. It was childish, sophomore crap, written in 1939 by a couple of guys that were losers. Our founders had the pictures hanging on the walls of meetings. Our founders. Goofy. One guy's a drunken dog, a, a doctor from Akron, and the other guy is a broken down stockbroker from New York, and he never even got rich after he got sober. And the doctor, oh, come on, you wouldn't let him lance a boil, this guy. And I still got this book, and I thought, but I'm going to tell him at my, when I get my cake, it's a lousy book. And you get the steps aren't shit. I never took him. And I think most of you speakers are phonies. And I think some of you are being paid. I could tell which ones. There's a few slick ones in here. I know what's going on. I wasn't born yesterday. I've been in the business all my life, baby. I know how to look good up there. I can tell some stories to your hair. And I know these people are lying. But it's all right. Because one of my thoughts was, I wonder what they do pay them. <laughs> if you knew, they don't. But I thought so. But I was going to make this speech and I was going to say, yeah, I don't believe in none of this stuff and I've been sober for a whole year. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was going to leave alcoholics on. But something happened along the way that threw me a curve. I heard a man speak when I was seven months sober and I identified with him. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but I did. And I did not identify with this man's drinking pattern. That's what I've been listening for for seven months. Somebody that drank exactly what I drank, who did exactly the same kind of work I did, who had drank in the same places I drank, anywhere where I could find identification in his drinking story, and I never heard that. But what this guy did was throw me a curve that night because he began to talk about emotions and feelings and he threw me on the floor with him because he was talking about me. He talked about fear in a way I'd never heard it described before. And I'd had it all my life and I never knew what it was. And when he talked about it, I said, oh my God, I don't want to be frightened. I don't want to be afraid. I want to be a man. I don't want to be a wimp. And he said, I'm one of the weakest people I know. And I sat there and I thought, no. <laughs> I am. And, I, and, and he saw, talked about this sensitivity. I never heard anybody say that. And he said, I'm more sensitive than you are. And I said, you ain't, you ain't really talked to me yet, pal. <laughs> but I heard it and I knew what he was talking about. And he talked about a sense of not fitting in and not belonging most of his life. Wherever the hell he was, he was in the wrong place. And it'll be better over there. We'll just go over there. It'll be okay. And it never is. And he went on and on and on in this vein. And if you hear Clancy here two years from now, that's who I'm talking about. And he said, finally he said, if you're walking around with a set of emotions, anything like what I'm describing, if your life has been anything like what I'm trying to tell you inside, and you seem somehow unable to control and enjoy your drinking, there's a name for that. <laughs> yeah, turns out it's a disease. And we call it alcoholism. He said, you know, the real curse of the alcoholic is not drinking anyway. And my ears went up. And what does he mean by that? Sure looks like it's drinking, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus, that's what we're talking about in here, ain't it? I mean, everybody talks about drinking. No, no. He said, the real curse of the alcoholic is not drinking. The real curse of the alcoholic, it turns out, is sobriety. 
That's why we can't stand. That's why we drink. <laughs> they talked about going for periods of time without drinking. One time he committed suicide sober. And how crazy he got and how bad it was and how awful it was. Sober. And so he had and so he had to begin to drink again the next time because it was the only relief he knew. Because it was the only answer he had. Sobriety, it turns out, is an agonizing, painful, horrible experience. That's why newcomers with 30 days of sobriety, 60 days of sobriety, walk around the room talking to themselves. <laughs> Guy with 60 days is sober just as long as I am or Keith is. He's sober that day. He's sober. He's as sober as he's ever going to get. People with a year, two years of sobriety act like children. We are all adolescents, maybe younger in my case. And we continue to act that way for a long time. What do you mean? I, I, I made the coffee at the meeting. You heard Charlie talk about it today. I set the goddamn chairs up straight and they moved them. And sobriety is the curse. Sobriety is the painful part. Sobriety is the thing we don't know anything about and none of us. We just, we don't stay sober long enough to find out much about it. But we know it ain't good. And so we drink again and they wonder why we drink again. God, we, we fixed him all up. We straightened him out. We got him sober. We took him to the hospital. We bought him a $15,000 big book. Now that looks like it ought to fix him, hadn't it? Jesus, we had him the best doctor's money could buy. And he's drunk again. Why did he do that? That's what happened. Whether we, I'm not knocking hospitals particularly. I think some of them are sobering people up and sending them to AA and doing a hell of a job. If they're sending them to AA and they're AA-oriented, they're doing a good job. And besides, I don't judge anybody. I just report what I see. But when I heard Clancy say that, I just, I just really knew what he was talking about. Our book here is written to take care of our sobriety problem. Not take care of drinking problem. The theory is we don't drink here. The minute I stop drinking, I have a whole new problem. It's called a sobriety problem. I always had that. This program and this book and these steps, much to my surprise, it turns out, are aimed at my sobriety problem. They are aimed at trying to make sobriety today just bearable enough that I won't have to start drinking again to feel better. We got a sobriety program here. It's not a drinking program, it's a sobriety program. Now, if you drink again, you don't have your sobriety problem anymore. You got a whole new problem. <laughs> because if I drink again, I'm back on the bandwagon. I'm back on that roller coaster. I'm back on that Ferris wheel. I'm back, as Chuck used to say, back in that trap I couldn't spring. Because I'll tell you, I came to love that man. I even came to understand one or two things he was saying. I later, as years went by, I started listening to his tapes. Even now, after he's dead, I listen to his tapes. And I would love to go and talk to him, but it's too late. But I still have his tapes, and it makes more sense to me now than it did then. But I was listening to a man who at that time had over 20 years of sobriety, and I was brand new. How the hell am I supposed to understand him? I think I'm supposed to feel like the guy that's got 10 years when I got 10 days? Of course not. I hear speakers talk and they tell me how wonderful everything is and how their lives are together and how everything's good in their lives and they've got money now. And I'm 30 days sober and I'm crazier than hell. And I'm wondering why the program doesn't work for me that way. Because Alcoholics Anonymous will do for me and for you, I presume, if you're an alcoholic of my type, exactly what drinking does. It makes you feel better. It did me. But it took a long time. <laughs> Nothing works faster than 12 ounces of scotch. But on the other hand, I haven't been arrested lately for driving while serene. <laughs> so now I know I'm an alcoholic. I'm screwed. I'm condemned to this crap for the rest of my life. I gotta sit in these damn meetings, listen to these speakers, tell me how wonderful it is. I'm still crazy. I'm seven months sober. I'm going to meetings and I'm making coffee and I'm mopping floors and I'm trying to help newcomers and they're all getting drunk. <laughs> I 
And then I had a spiritual experience. The first spiritual experience I'd ever had in AA. The redhead walked by. <laughs> was the days of mini skirts, and she's got the greatest legs in North America. And she walked by, and I just started following her everywhere. And I said to Keith, I said, Boy, oh, she's so cute. He said, Why don't you ask her out to coffee? I said, She wouldn't go. How do you know? Did you ask her? No. And that went on for some period of time. And finally, I started walking up to her meetings, and I'd say, uh, How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> she said, how long have you been sober? I'd say, uh, about seven months. Well, I don't date newcomers, and she'd walk away. And I'd walk back, and I'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not all that new, and later on I'm going to be old, so let's get with it now. <laughs> she looked at me one time, she said, how many children do you have? I said, well, I got six, but they're very small. You hardly notice them, just little. <laughs> the oldest one was 12. The youngest one was about a year. Finally, she couldn't figure this nut out. She came over to my house one Saturday morning, and I had a drunk sleeping on my couch. And he smelled real bad. And she came in, and, uh, and the kids were upstairs, and she just wanted to see these children. She couldn't believe what was going on here. And here's this drunk, his name was Kenny, never did sober up as far as I know. But Kenny was at one time one of the top photographers for Disney. And he was drunk and he smelled bad and he was laying on my couch. I found him in the bushes at the Glendale Public Library, that's where he was, that's where he'd been staying. And he was on my couch and Carol came in and she went up and got the kids and brought them down, the little ones, you know, and she's just nuts about kids. And she looked over at Ken and she said, what's that? I said, oh, that's a newcomer. <laughs> She said, yes, it certainly is. <laughs> Could you get him a bath? But you know, that's kind of the way it went. And I, Carol and I started dating and we finally, when I was a year and a half sober, she married me. She had two kids and I had six kids. And I thought, this is gonna be a marriage made in heaven, baby. We're just gonna work the steps together for the rest of our lives. And it's just gonna be wonderful. Keith was the best man. Clancy, her sponsor, was the gave the bride away. He said, with some pleasure. And, uh, <laughs> I just report to you what the man said. I, and uh, we had about 600 alcoholics at our wedding. And this wedding, Carol's right, yesterday, it just brought it all back. I was thinking about these two drunks getting married. And I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Bless you, my children. Oh, God knows. Because I'll tell you why I think any two alcoholics trying to live in the same house together, there is some serious question on every day who's in charge. <laughs> She and I started fighting right off the bat. We fought about kids, we fought about money, we fought about everything. We fought about AA. I believed in certain things and she believed in certain things. And she's got three or more years than me. She just got 20 years this year. And, uh, and she used to call me the newcomer. <laughs> and by the time I'm two years sober, baby, I'm talking here and there at meetings. I'm rather well known in certain quarters. There's people in Alcoholics Anonymous that think I'm okay. And she looked at me and said, oh, you newcomer. If I ask you to get me a cup of coffee, you got to do it. <laughs> Pissed me off. <laughs> when I was two and a half years sober, I got a big time job offer back east. And I thought, aha, now I'm going to get what I got coming. Now I'm going to get the money, baby. Now I'm going to get the things. I'm going to get the stuff. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be somebody, finally, because I'm sober. And I went back there, and I found out the meetings in Philadelphia were different. And I translate different bad. And I like the meetings. And they work California style. They don't say hi to the speaker there. You get up and say, I'm Barney, and I'm an alcoholic, and they just all look at you. And then I'll read chapter 5 from the big book. Remember the one I hated? <laughs> they don't read it and I'm pissed off. <laughs> they don't read the traditions. They don't even have birthdays and birthday cakes. 
They call them anniversaries back there. Nobody sings happy birthday to you, yeah, happy birthday to you. <laughs> I didn't like it. So I did the only thing that any right-thinking egomaniac can do. I denied them my presence. If they can't do it right, I ain't going to their meeting. So I started my own meeting, California style, baby. We read chapter five, we read the traditions. I was the secretary. I made the coffee. I wrote the format. I picked all the speakers. I greeted everybody at the door. A lot of people called it Barney's meeting. And I loved it. But I went to work for CBS back there. The ratings weren't going up. I'm doing everything I know how to be successful. I'm trying to make it in life. I'm trying to get some stuff going. I'm trying to make something happen here, baby. I'm working my ass off, and the ratings ain't moving. And the guys at CBS in New York and the Black Ivory Tower are looking at me funny. And I'm, and I'm getting crazy because she now decides that I'm a real idiot. And she don't want to be around me, and she's fighting with me all the time. And the kids are taking drugs and drinking. Now, that's not fair. <laughs> Everybody knows that's not fair. And I tried to counsel them. <laughs> and they didn't want to hear it. And life was not going well. Not the way I planned it. And I was just scared. I'm getting crazier by the day. And you remember, I'm only going basically to one meeting a week and the other ones I drop into once in a while. And I'm crazy. And I don't know what the hell to do. And I'm just mad, and I'm angry, and I'm pissed at her, and I'm pissed at CBS, and I'm pissed at the kids. And life is just awful! My sobriety problem kicked in again. <laughs> and I don't know what's the matter. Because I think I'm a member of AA. I've been sober now three years. I'm okay. What's the matter with all these people? Why are they treating me this way? Why are they screwing me again? Why me? And a guy with 18 years of sobriety came to my house one night, and he said, how you doing? I said, how much time have you got? He said, I got time, and I sat down and told him. I said, that bitch I married is driving me crazy. Can't stand it. She's an alcoholic now. She'd never know it. She'd know how to work the third step. <laughs> Those kids are driving me nuts. They're drinking and using. They won't listen to me. The goddamn ratings are not going up. My life is a mess. And for two hours, I went on in this vein, telling, pouring out my heart to this man. Tell him, finally telling somebody the truth about it all. And you know what he said to me? How many meetings do you go to? <laughs> I said, what the hell has that got to do with anything? I've been sober three years, baby. He said, how many newcomers you work with? I knew he was just crazy. He said, I don't work with newcomers. I used to work with newcomers, now I got drunk. I'm not good at that. Besides, I haven't met any newcomers here on the East Coast. He said, yes, I know. They go to those meetings you don't attend. And finally, he looked at me and he said, what are you doing about the third step? And I said, whoa. Like, you mean God and all that? No, thank you. I don't believe in God, Phil. My higher power first was him. Because he's so big, and he was lo sober a long time. My higher power and I figured, geez, he may get drunk. So I made my higher power, everybody in my group. So I figured, well, I'm going to get drunk the same night. <laughs> and then I expanded it, and I decided somewhere in my brilliance that my higher power was going to be Alcoholics Anonymous worldwide. <laughs> All of the alcoholics around the world in every country linked together in spirituality. I told him that. <laughs> he said, how's it working for you today? <laughs> I but I said, I care. All I, I had to do that in order to do the fourth step and the fifth step. He insisted before I had two years sobriety, I had to do a fourth and fifth. And he gave me a deadline, and I wrote the goddamn thing on an airplane. I thought, oh, shit, I'll do it, okay. 
I read it to him. I didn't feel any better. He looks at me and says, Welcome to Alcoholics at home. Oh, Jesus. But I don't have any God. I don't have any higher power. I don't understand that crap. I don't understand that. I rebelled against the whole notion of God in my life. First of all, you got to remember, I'm a moral leper. If there is a God, I'm screwed. I'm the guy that likes sin, you remember? And this guy looked at me and he said, I think, Barney, if you're going to want to feel better and maybe stay sober, that you're going to have to go to those meetings even if you don't think they're properly run. And he said, I think you're going to have to begin to work with newcomers because they may save your life. And finally, you must begin to pray. And I said, well, I can't pray because it makes me feel like a phony. He said, that's okay. You are a phony. <laughs> and I bought that. I said, yeah, all my life, that's the way I've been. I'm always pretending to be something I'm not because I, I want people to like me. I'll be anything you want me to be. A gorilla? I'll be a gorilla. I don't care. He said, so just say this prayer. And I said, could I say a phony prayer? He said, sure. But say the one in the book here. Let's try that. And I said, could I say it to a phony God? He said, absolutely. Take the action whether you believe in it or not. Where'd I heard that before? I said, okay. So I start going to meetings. I'm grabbing newcomers by the throat and threatening them. <laughs> you call me at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And some of them did. I don't know why. And some of them stayed sober. Now, I don't know what to do with them when they're sober. They're in your living room, they're in your kitchen, they're on the phone, they won't leave you alone. Call you up, what meeting are we going to tonight? So what do you mean, we, you're the newcomer, shit. <laughs> oh, you're in the meeting and you're trying to look good, you're a sponsor now, so you gotta look good. Walk around and act like you know about the steps. And you're talking to a couple of people who are your kind of people, sober at least three years. And some stupid newcomer walks up and says, how do you work the third step? It's very embarrassing if you have to look at him and say, I don't know, I never tried that one. <laughs> but I tell you what I started doing with these guys, because I don't want to lie to them. I really don't want to lie to them. I'm so tired of lying to everybody. And so I began to do something that was strange for me. I told them the truth. I told him how sick I was. I opened the zipper and let him see what was inside, and I don't want to do that. I don't want anybody to know what a corrupt, no good son of a bitch I am. I don't want him to know. I want everybody to think I'm wonderful. Mr. 12 Step. But I'm not. I'm a sick cookie. And I had to tell these guys. I don't understand higher power. I say a prayer to a phony God. I don't know what's going on. I go to meetings. I make coffee. What do I know? I don't drink, stupid. That's all I know. Well, I don't understand. Well, then go make coffee. I'm going to meetings. I'm saying my prayer. I'm working with newcomers. God knows. I'm trying. Still fighting with her. And I get fired. I went back to San Diego, and I went to work down there for a joint. And the uh, job wasn't up to my standards. So I quit. And I went home and I started meditating. I meditated for five months. <laughs> Something very peculiar happens to me when I don't work. I run out of money. And I ran out of money. We got three months behind in the mortgage. And uh, we owe just lots of money and I'm feeling crazy and I'm going to meetings and I'm working with... I got guys I sponsor driving up to my house in Mercedes Benz. And they're pissing me off. <laughs> And they're telling me how wonderful it all is. And I'm six years sober and I want to kill them. But I was crazy. And one night she looked at me and she said, are you going to get a job or what? I said, I don't know. I go up in the tower and I'll think about it. She says, well, while you're thinking about it, I'll be gone, baby, because I'm divorcing you. I've had it. And I knew she meant it. And, and what it meant to me that night was a failure. More than anything else, it meant another failure in my life. I failed. But I knew that she was right. I knew that I was a failure. I, I, I finally reached the stage that he talked about. I finally got to the point in my sobriety 
where I understood completely and totally and for the first time really that I was appealed zero. I finally knew it and I accepted it because that's the way it was. I had tried to be a success drunk and I failed. I tried to be a success sober and I failed. I couldn't function anymore. I couldn't work in television anymore. I knew that. I couldn't do anything right anymore and I just was a loser. Couldn't keep a woman happy, couldn't make her love me, couldn't make her happy. I did all this crap, couldn't do anything. The kids were just nuts and they wouldn't do it right. And I went down and sat in front of a bar in La Jolla, California one night for two hours. I was six years sober. And I sat in front of that bar and I thought about drinking. And I guess I had just been to too many meetings, I don't know. Because I knew drinking wasn't going to help. And I'll tell you what, when you find out drinking ain't going to help, you're screwed. Because the one answer I always had, the one thing that would always work for me, the one thing that would always make me feel better, I now knew was going to work. And I didn't know what to do. And I went down to the beach, walked around down there, kicked the sand, sat down, cried. I felt sorry for myself. I really did. I was sad. I sat on the beach and I cried. And I thought, Jesus, I've tried all my life to be something. I've tried drunk and I've tried sober and I've sponsored people and I've gone to meetings. I even started a couple of meetings. And all these people in A are feeling so good, and I'm the only one that feels like shit. I'm the only one here that just knows he's a loser. I know I'm a bad member of AA. I know I bullshit people. I don't deserve to sponsor people. They deserve somebody that cares. And I don't really care about those guys. I'm sponsoring them because I'm supposed to. I don't feel anything for them. I don't give a shit. And I know that. And I hate myself for that, but that's the way it is. And I don't know what to do. And I cried. And I found myself somehow or other, because I'd done it so often, saying that stupid prayer I didn't believe in. And I stopped and I thought, what do you do that for? You don't believe in God. You're really a phony son of a bitch, aren't you? And I looked up because that's where he's supposed to be. And I just looked up and I said, you son of a bitch. I give up. If I had known that night that I was surrendering, I probably wouldn't have done it. If I knew that night or for some period of time after that that I was genuinely doing something about the third step, I probably wouldn't have done it. I just gave up because I couldn't make it, folks. I was a failure and I knew that. And I couldn't do anything right, including AA. And I accepted that about myself. And my thought was this. I'll just go get some stupid job someplace, and I don't care what it is. I'll make tacos in Laguna Beach. I don't care. And I'll just go to work every day, and I'll show up on time, and I'll try to look alert. Because it's all I got left. And so I got this dumb job back up in Los Angeles as a field reporter in a joint where I used to be the anchor man. And I didn't like that. But I went to work and I show up every day and I look alert and I got 28 year old kids telling me what to do. And I just say thank you very much and I go do it. And a guy walked up to me about six months after I went back to work there and he said, hey, I gotta tell you something. Hiring you is probably the best decision I ever made. I thought he was talking about somebody else. I said, what? See, he don't know that I just show up and look alert. He thinks I know what I'm doing. I, know, I didn't tell him. He said, I'd like to sign a contract with us. And I said, that's fine. He said, well, I want a deal. I want to negotiate a five-year deal here, Barney. And I said, that's fine. He said, we got to know how much money you got to have. We're going to sit down and negotiate the deal. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't negotiate anymore. He said, well, who's your agent? I said, I don't have an agent anymore. He said, well, how are we going to negotiate a deal then? I said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just write the number on the piece of paper and I'll sign it. How would that be? And he said, are you sure? I said, yeah, that's fine. Because how much money I make, and I know this, how much money I make is none of my business. My job is to show up and look alert every day. What they pay me is none of my business. They're going to pay me what they want to pay me anyway. So what the hell's the difference? And he put a much bigger number on the piece of paper than I've asked him for, and I laughed and I signed it. <laughs> Five years later, same deal. Put the number on the paper, fine. I laughed and I signed it. I got a report to you today. I've been back there 11 years now. Haven't asked him for a raise. Don't care. It's none of my business. Carol and I have a nice home today because I don't know how to deal with her. I don't know how to deal with her. I'm crazy about her. I'm mad in love with this woman. She makes me crazy. And I don't know how to straighten her out. I don't know how to fix her. I'm trying to make her happy and I can't make her happy. I'm trying to make her love me and I can't make her love me. And I tried everything I knew. Every game I ever ran didn't work. 
So I just decided, okay, I'll do at home what I do at work. I just show up and look alert. And she began to work with these women that she talked about in La Jolla, and she began to fit into that AA world there, and she's all these beautiful girls that she sponsors, and they call her on the phone, I can I call talk to Carol. And I sponsor guys, and then, you know, we started another meeting on Saturday night in La Jolla down there, and I'm the coffee maker there. And, it, and we started out, and we thought, you know, we'll have about 50 people in here, be fine. We'll max out maybe at 100 when it gets real successful. A couple weeks ago, Keith spoke for us back, I don't know, a couple months ago, we had 520 people in that meeting. I can't believe it. I don't know where the hell they're coming from. Alcoholics Anonymous is the craziest place I've ever been in my life. Absolutely insane. We do everything backwards here. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing. But it's a wonderful place for me. Maybe for you, but for me, I know. And i got to believe the fact is you're all patient enough to sit here and listen to this crap so long. I apologize for talking so long. But you get my mouth around and I can't stop. But i got to tell you today, I have a wonderful life. My, my eight children are doing extraordinarily well. The oldest boy, because he did not want to die, came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Been sober now eight years. I sponsored him once and he got drunk, and then I gave him to the best sponsor I knew, and he got drunk again. And then he got a sponsor that I knew wasn't going to work, and now he's got eight years. He married a girl in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they got two little alcoholic babies. I have a son who lives near me in Orange County, and he sells broadcast time for uh, <coughs> Turner Broadcast. I have daughters who work in television production in Hollywood. One of them's a producer, one of them's a production coordinator. They're happily married. We have a son who pitches, plays baseball, played the minor leagues. Now this last year he played in Italy. He was the most valuable player in the Italian league. And now he's on his way to Australia. He's going to play over there and coach. And he's, he's married to this gorgeous girl and they have this great life. And uh, I have a girl that's just in college and she's going to go to England and study for a year. And, and then the last one who just graduated high school, she's starting in Northridge in September if I let her live. <laughs> but they're all doing great. I mean, the kids are just wonderful in spite of me, in spite of her, in spite of everything. The kids are doing fine. And they're in good shape. And they're healthy mentally and physically. So far as of today, they're doing fine. And I'm very proud of those kids. And I'm proud of my grandchildren. I just have a lot of fun with them. And I'm proud of, of, of Carol and, and our life together. Because now it's just the two of us. Now the kids are gone. And it's just the two of us. But it's a good life today that we have. It is a wonderful life that we have today. But I'm going to tell you, newcomer, if what I'm saying makes you throw up, it's okay. Because you just come back to another meeting tomorrow night and bring your goddamn pain with you. And bring your agony and bring your fear in these rooms, baby. Come on in here and hate it. I don't care. But put your ass in the chair. You can hate us. That's okay. You can hate yourself. That's fine. You can believe AA will never work for you. Wonderful. It don't matter what you think, baby, and it really doesn't matter how you feel. It's what you do that matters. Kick it into action. Make some coffee. Fold some chairs. Be a greeter. Get active in Alcoholics Anonymous because if my experience is worth anything to you, it works. I have nothing else to recommend it. This has been working for me for over 17 years. Been working for her for 20 years. Been working for him for 20, 22 years. Man back here with over 30 years. It works. You're in a room here filled with people who have suffered the same pain, the same anxieties, the same frustrations that you have suffered, believe it or not, and who also somehow seemed unable to control and enjoy their drinking. And they came here and they stopped drinking, and then they got a hold of a copy of this stupid book, and they began to work on it, and it deals with that horrible sobriety problem that I still have every day. That's why I'm here. That's why I come to these things. That's why I come to, you know, Pony, Montana. Just to tell you that uh, something's going on here that's good for people like me. you got to be a sick son of a bitch. Very helpful. I'll tell you one more thing and then I'm going to shut up. I have finally, 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 after a long period of time, come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. He hasn't done it yet, but I think he can.